In this video, I wanna teach you all about YNAB targets, what they are, why I use them, and how to choose the correct targets for your categories. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Nick True, and I've personally spent over 6,000 hours on one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, helping people better manage their budget. And now I wanna help you do the same. So what are targets? Well, in YNAB, it's best to think about a target as your plan. It's what you would like to do. It's not saying that you are ready to do this just yet. It's not saying you have the money just yet. Instead, it's basically saying, this is what I would like to do in the future when I get more dollars. If we're using the envelope metaphor, which I often use a lot when teaching people how to use YNAB, assigning your money in YNAB, which we're going to show in a second, is the equivalent of actually putting money in the envelope. But a target, on the other hand, is the equivalent of you taking a pen or pencil and writing on the outside of the envelope what you would like to do. Assigning money means that you have the money in your bank account and you're ready to give it a job. Targeting, if you will, is the equivalent of saying, I would like to use my money in the future to do this thing. When I get more money, I would like to assign this much, but I'm not ready yet. So that's kind of the difference between a target and a signing. This is important because when we take a look at YNAB, they do show up in different places. You can see here, for example, that in the Nick fund spending category, I have a target of $50 per month. Now, if you're not seeing this in your YNAB, you might need to toggle on the setting for showing your progress bars. So in the top right hand corner, if you click on this, you can toggle on or off the progress bars. One of the things that this does when you toggle them on is it will show the targets that you have set right here in the name of that particular category. Over on the right hand side, you can also see this is the target menu and you can edit those targets or if you don't have one created at all, then when you click this, you can click over here and click create target. And again, I'm gonna do 50 a month and save. Now we're gonna get more into the specifics of how to use these targets here in a second. But first, I wanna tell you why I think targets are so important. There are three main reasons that I use targets. The first is that targets save me time. Let's take a look back at YNAB. Whenever you get paid, you know that one of the things you're supposed to do is assign those new dollars. So let's say that I've got money up here and ready to assign. I can come down and start assigning money to my category. So I could start typing, you know, 18, 74, 90 into the mortgage. Then I could come down here and type 355 into my utilities. And I could go through line by line and type in what I would like to assign to that category for this particular month. But if I use targets, rather than having to retype those numbers in every single month, every time I get paid, I can use YNAB's auto assign feature to automatically fund my targets. I can click assign right up here, click auto, and then click under funded. Now, if I do this, YNAB will automatically fund my targets based first on the due dates that I have set, then based on uh, the target type and some prioritization, whether it's a monthly or yearly. And then finally, once it's funded all of those things, it just goes top to bottom. Now, if I want a little bit of a hybrid here, maybe I don't want to let YNAB fully assign everything and I would like to do a little bit of uh, picking and choosing myself, I could select some of the key things that I wanted to make sure that I funded, and I could fund those first. So I could come down here and select all of these guys, and then I could come over here and click the underfunded button. And when I do that, boom. Now YNAB automatically funds these items that I have selected based on the targets that I have set. And so this is important because every time I get paid, I don't want to have to reassign all of the money. I want the money to come into ready to assign. And then I want to click one button and automatically fund my categories based on the targets that I've chosen. Now, the second reason that I think targets are so important is that they help us plan for things that we sometimes forget about, the irregular expenses that inevitably pop up. Things like auto maintenance and home maintenance, and also once a year expenses like Christmas or an annual life insurance premium or even your YNAB subscription. It can also help us plan for those kind of fun but irregular things like, you know, a baby shower or a wedding or getting a birthday gift for a friend that we care a lot about. The idea behind targets is to try and normalize your ups and downs across your life spending so that every month feels the same, even though it's technically up and down. 
if you were to look at the reports for your actual spending, the money that leaves your bank account, it's going to vary wildly from month to month, depending on if you had a major car expense that month, or if it was December and you bought a bunch of Christmas presents, or the month that you had finally saved up and taken that vacation that you've been planning for. Your technical spending is going to be lots of up and down. But when we take those items and we break them out onto a regular monthly cadence, it makes the budget very stable because we can take all of these big one-time expenses and normalize them to be the same amount every single month. You'll see more of what I'm talking about here in a second. Now, the third reason that I think targets are critical is that they help us compare our game plan with what we actually make, our income, and make sure that we can actually afford what we are planning to do. Right, So if you take all of these irregular expenses, auto maintenance and home maintenance and gifts, and the one-time expenses like a big vacation that you're saving up for, and you work them into your normal monthly budget, once we've set targets for everything, YNAB allows us to look at our total targets for any given month, and then we can compare that to the income that we expect to make for that month and make sure that we actually are planning to spend less than we earn. After all, this is the whole point of budgeting in the first place. And this is one of my biggest gripes for people who don't want to use targets in YNAB. They'll say that they want to focus just on assigning the money each time, and they don't care about the time savings or some of the other benefits of targets. And I get that. But the problem is if you are only ever assigning the money and you're not thinking about the longer term things that you need to be setting money aside for, you will often forget about them. And so, yes, you might be able to assign all of your dollars for this paycheck and you might even be able to live within your means for that paycheck. But if you are not adequately planning for the things that are definitely going to be coming up, the things that are definitely going to happen that you're going to spend money on down the road, if you're not thinking about those, targeting them and then planning for that inside of your normal monthly income, then inevitably when those things come, you are going to spend more than you make. And that's why targets are so critical. Yes, they save us time. And yes, they help us plan for the unexpected. But more importantly than that, they help us ensure that our game plan fits within our income. So now that you know why targets are so important, let's talk about how to choose the correct target type for your different categories. If we jump into YNAB, let's start with Spotify here. Now, for every target, you're going to need to choose four specific items for each individual one. Let's take a look. If I click Edit Target over here and zoom into this menu, the first thing that you're going to notice is that you will need to choose the cadence for each target. Now, when I say cadence, what I mean is how often does this expense occur? You can see that we have some options here. So we've got weekly. Now, I don't typically use the weekly cadence very often unless literally I am paying for something on a weekly basis. A lot of people will do this with things like groceries, but I think it ends up adding more confusion than necessary unless you are only shopping for groceries one specific day a week. So a weekly cadence tends to be good for something like your kid's piano lessons that you pay for every single Friday. So for most people, uh, we're not going to use a lot of weekly, but that's one option here. The next is monthly, which is pretty self-explanatory. The next is yearly, so something that occurs once a year. And then the next would be a custom cadence. And so this allows you to set odd cadences like every other month or once a quarter, something like that. Now, the next thing that you're going to do is how much money, the amount of money that you need for that particular cadence. In this case, I'm using Spotify as the example. So this would be a monthly cadence and the amount is going to be $16.99. Now, the third thing that we're going to choose is buy. This is when the specific date that this will thing will happen. If I click on buy, you can see that on monthly, I can choose any day of the month. If I'm choosing a weekly cadence, then I have to choose which day of the week this occurs on. If I choose a yearly cadence, then I'm going to choose the specific calendar day. So I'm going to cycle through the calendar and find which day this is going to occur on. And if I choose custom, I'm going to do the exact same thing, which specific day this will occur on. In this case with Spotify, I'm going to choose monthly and I'm going to set this by, let's say that this happens every month on the 14th. Now, the last piece is the behavior of the target. This is the one that most people tend to get tripped up on. Let me zoom back out here and zoom into this one and we'll take a look. You're going to notice that there are two options for the behavior. The first is set aside another and the second is refill up to. My favorite analogy for this is going to the gas station and filling up your car's tank of gas. Imagine that you drive up to the pump and you put in a full tank of gas. Most people do not do this. 
If you were to pull in a full tank of gas, unless you were literally flying into the gas station on fumes and, and had literally nothing left in your gas tank, if you put in a full tank of gas, you would overflow the tank. Instead, what most people do is they top off the tank. They refill the tank. So if you go to the gas station and you have a quarter of a tank left and then you fill it up, you are putting in three quarters, right? You are just filling up the tank. You are refilling in YNAB's language. And so the idea is if there is leftover money at the end of the month, would you like for YNAB to count the leftovers towards next month's target? Let's take a look at groceries to explain this a little bit more. So I have a grocery target of $750 per month. If I were to choose refill up to, and I had $50 left at the end of the month of September, in October, it would count the $50 towards the $750 target. And YNAB would prompt me to only refill $700 in order to top off the tank, so to speak. Let's literally play that out in YNAB right now. I'm going to come back into the month of August and I'm going to assign $50. Okay. So here I am at the end of the month of August. I have $50 available. And now when I go into September, you will notice that although my target says $750, YNAB is only prompting me for $700. It's counting the $50 that's left in there towards the $750 target. And it's asking me to refill to 750. Now imagine that instead of choosing refill, I choose set aside another. Set aside another says, I want to put the full tank of gas in regardless if there's gas already in there or not. I want to put the full amount in every single time. If I do that, then when I hit save, set aside another and hit save here, boom, you will notice that even though I have $50 here, YNAB is still prompting me for the full 750. If I were to put 700 in here instead of 750, you'll notice that YNAB says I have not achieved my target. That's what the yellow indicates. The yellow in this case indicates that I have a target that I have not fully funded. I have not assigned enough to hit the target. You can see that it says 50 more is needed by the end of the month. Now, if I again change this target back to refill up to, you'll notice that it will now turn green and tell me that I have achieved my target fundamentally. When you are looking at each of your targets, you need to choose the cadence, you need to choose the amount, the date that it's due by, and if there's money left over at the end of the month, what you want to do with that money. Do you want to refill up to, so you're going to count the money towards next month, or do you want to set aside another? You are going to put 750 in every single month, no matter what which means that if you have leftovers, this category will start to accumulate and grow. You will start to stockpile money in that category. Now, before I move on to some specific examples, I do want to point out that there are a couple of outliers. Um, and so if you click on custom and then choose this, you will see another option here that says have a balance of. I almost never use this because I have found that Almost always, if I need to do some sort of weird custom like this, set aside another or fill up typically is going to make more sense. Also, if I'm doing something that's really, really, really long term that I'm saving up for, I have found that most of the time it still makes more sense to do a monthly set aside another. Basically try to save a certain amount every month towards that thing. Have a balance of, to me, only makes good sense to do if you know the total amount of money you need for something and you have a very specific date that you need that by, which in practical cases, I've found that to be very rare for most people. And again, one more little disclaimer before moving on to the actual examples here is I would say that when in doubt, most people should choose monthly, set aside another for almost everything. This is going to be the most conservative option because we're taking something and we're breaking it down to the amount you want to do per month. And then we are conservatively saying, hey, worst case, uh, just go ahead and make me set aside the full amount every single month. So in a worst case scenario, you end up accumulating extra money in this category. So I would tell you that 80, 90 percent of your targets are going to be monthly set aside another, and when in doubt, I would just choose that as your option. With that being said, let's get into some specific scenarios. Now, let's start out with super easy one. 
a monthly fixed bill. Pretty straightforward, right? Spotify, we kind of already did this. Edit on the target, monthly, specific amount, by the specific date that it's due, and we're gonna set aside another right here. Now, for monthly fixed bills, you can technically choose refill up to or set aside another. Theoretically, this shouldn't change the behavior because if it's happening every single month, then there will never be any money left over. And so it doesn't really matter for practical purposes which one you choose for this. But again, I just like to choose set aside another just to be safe. But to that point, not all of your bills are fixed. Some of them vary, like utilities. What do you do with that? Well, you can see here in this category, I've got utilities and internet, and I've actually got them combined. And so in this case, I would basically need to do some back of the napkin math and take a look at my past utility bills, figure out, okay, between my gas, sewer, electric, water, and my internet bill, what do I average over the course of a year? If I was going to combine everything like this, then what I would do is I would make sure that I choose monthly, 355, and you've got two options depending on how you want to handle this, okay? So option one is you would type in the amount that is the most your utility bill has ever been. And so if you live in an area where the AC is just blasting in the summer and your summer tends to be really expensive, or if you live in an area where you need to crank the gas up in the winter and your winter is very expensive, look at how much you've spent the most and you would set your target to that and then refill up to. What this does is it makes you budget the full amount the very first month. And then whenever you use less than that, the next month, you just have to budget to top off the tank, so to speak, right? You just refill up to the most that it's ever been. If you like this option, that's fine. The downside of this option is it will vary, right? Your month to month is gonna vary just like your actual utility bills. And so for practical purposes, I don't do this. What I like to do is I like to choose set aside another. And then I look at the average over the course of a 12 month cycle. And so maybe over the course of a year, I know that I average 300 and then I can hit save. What this does is it makes me budget 300 every single month. So if my utilities tend to be pretty low during the winter, then over the winter, I'm going to start to stockpile money in that category. So that then when the summer rolls around, even though the bill is much more expensive, I still only have to budget the 300 a month because I have been stockpiling money through the winter. I'm prepared for it. Now, some of you are gonna write a comment below and be like, my town allows me to do fixed billing, which is awesome. And if your town does, then just use that. It makes it super easy. And then it becomes a fixed bill like everything else. But if you don't have that option, I like to use the 300 set aside another. All right, let's take a look at another one. Let's do a yearly expense this time. Let's come down here to irregular. And let's take a look at something like uh, the YNAB subscription, perfect example. If I come over here and click edit on this target, you're going to notice that I've chosen a yearly, the full amount that I'm going to have to pay, and the due date that this is going to be due on. Now, this is very important. A lot of people will mistakenly think that they want to have the money ready a month early. And so if YNAB is going to process in July, they might say, well, I want to have this ready by June 2025. Let me see if I can explain this. This is a problem because what happens is that YNAB resets the target on the month that you choose. And so if in June you have the money ready to go, but then it resets the target for next year, then when the payment processes in July, YNAB thinks that that is for next year's payment, not this year's, which is a huge problem. You'll know that this is a mistake when you've set this and then YNAB stops prompting you for money every single month. Basically, if you go into the next month and this is grayed out and you don't have a sentence here that says you need more money, you can bet that you have chosen a yearly target with the incorrect month. So it's very important that when you choose a yearly target, choose the exact month that this processes. Similarly, let's look at Christmas spending. You'll notice, for example, that Christmas spending I've chosen yearly and I've put the due date as December 25th. Now, technically, I do want to point out it doesn't actually matter whether I choose December 1st or December 31st or the 25th. From a YNAB perspective, it will all basically behave the same. But it is important that I choose December, not November, because if I do any Christmas shopping, any at all, in December, I want it to count for this year's Christmas. 
not next year's. So that's the critical piece with yearly expenses. Now, as for whether or not you choose refill up to or set aside another, I found that in this case, always again being conservative, set aside another is best because it will just force you to do the full amount. But in most practical cases, if you had leftover money in a yearly category like Christmas, then refill up to is probably fine. You'll just let that money roll over and be used for next Christmas. So that covers a lot of the examples of things that have due dates. But what do you do for things that don't have specific due dates? Let's come back up here and look at something like fun spending. So let's take a look at eating out. In this case, you can see that I've chosen eating out monthly, 150, and I've defaulted to set aside another. Again, though, some people may say, well, you know what? I don't really need to build up money in eating out. If I, if I do come under budget in eating out, it's not like I want to do more eating out next month. And so maybe I'm okay to actually change this one to be refill up to. But some people would say, no, actually, I do want to be able to build that up. If I really squeeze tightly and, and don't go out to eat much this month, I want to be able to reward myself and have a little more next month. That's totally up to you. That's exactly what Hannah and I do with our individual fund spending money. You'll see here that if I choose this, if I don't spend all of my money in this particular month, well, then next month, I still get the full amount so I can actually start to grow and build up my money. If I want to buy something that's a little bit more expensive, I might need to save up a few months worth of spending money and let that build in order for me to get it. So let's take a look at something like groceries while we're talking about this. Should you set groceries for refill up to or set aside another? Well, it depends. For a lot of people, refill up to is just fine. They don't have a ton of variability in their grocery spending. It's pretty consistent month to month. And if you have a little bit left over, you can just top it off the next month. But I have found that if you do a lot of hosting, irregular hosting especially, or if you are the parent of college age kids, who are gone for the school year, but then come home and raid your kitchen through the summer and the winters, then you would want to choose set aside another. You'd want to think about how much do we spend on average. And when the kids are gone and away at school, you want to be stockpiling money for groceries each month to prepare for when they return in the summer. Now, for some people, maybe that's so extreme that I've actually set up dedicated categories just for the kids being home for the summer to make sure that we are saving for that. Um, but you can decide whether or not you need that extra layer of grocery savings or not. Now, the next example that I want to show you has to do with items that are also, again, irregular. You don't know when they're going to happen, but they don't happen every single month. This could be something irregular like home maintenance or auto maintenance, but it also could be something that you are saving up for, but you don't have a specific date. What do we do in those cases? Well, let's take auto maintenance, for example. When you set up your auto maintenance target, what you want to do is think about how much might I spend over the course of a year and then divide by 12. So think about your oil changes. If you live up in Canada, you might need to think about your tire chains or tire changes to your winter tires and sets. If you have a really, really old vehicle that you know is likely to break down, then you might want to bump this up so that you are prepared when it enters the shop. And so either way, I'm going to be thinking about, okay, well, if I spend, you know, $1,200 a year on maintenance, or I think I might spend that much, then I should do $100 per month. And I want to make sure that I do set aside another. That's key here. And so for all of these things like home maintenance, auto maintenance, medical emergency, small trips, kitchen renovation, things that don't have specific dates, but I want to be setting aside money every single month to prepare for those things, we want to choose monthly set aside another. And if you'd like a handy dandy tool to do this, uh, we've created a YNAB targets decision tree that can help you decide on what target is right for you. Let's walk through an example of something like birthday gifts, wedding gifts, that kind of a thing. You can see I have a category here for that. Let's use that as an example and walk through this decision tree. So do you spend from this category every month or are you saving for a future expense? Um, well, I would say this one's more of a future expense. I don't necessarily have a birthday every single month that I'm buying for. All right, so future date. Will this repeat or is it a one time? It's definitely going to repeat because people have multiple birthdays and I get invited to weddings and baby showers. So we'll say repeat. Is this irregular or does it repeat on a set interval? Definitely irregular. Unless I'm creating categories for every single person in my life and their birthdays, uh, this is going to be irregular because it's just kind of a mixture. And you can see here that it comes down to set aside another either monthly or weekly. And again, 
like I said earlier, unless I have a highly specific reason to use weekly, I'm going to choose monthly, set aside another. In this case, if I click edit, you can see that's exactly what I've chosen. $70 per month, last day of the month, because there's not a specific day this happens on, and then set aside another is what I've chosen here. If you like this decision tree here, you can check out the link down in the description below and grab a copy for yourself. All right, now before moving on, I wanna show you two other special cases, and they both have to do with debt. The first is credit card targets. I'm not gonna go way deep into credit cards here. You can check out my credit card guide video for that. But when it comes to setting targets for credit cards, the options you have are a little bit different. I should say that this is only for people who are not yet paying their credit cards completely in full and most importantly, off the credit card float. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail about that in this video, I don't have time, but what I wanna tell you is that unless the amount of money you have available is equal to the outstanding balance on your card, then you are either working to pay down debt or you are riding the credit card float. And in both of those situations, you need a target. When we come over here, you'll notice that there are two options for the credit card. The first is pay off balance by date. And the second is pay specific amount monthly. I will go ahead and tell you that for most people, I have found the pay off balance by date not to be a good fit. Unless you are doing like a very, very specific debt pay down plan and you know exactly when you're going to try and pay this thing off by, then I found that this one can be a little bit too aggressive because if you get one month behind, some unexpected thing happens, then all of a sudden it's wanting you to do way more money the next month to catch up and this becomes difficult. So I found for most people choosing the pay specific amount monthly is the way to go. And if you're working on a debt snowball, and this is not your number one debt that you are primarily focused on, then you would want to choose pay specific amount monthly, and the amount you would put in here would be the minimum payment amount. So maybe I'll do $90 as an example here. Either way, pay specific amount monthly is the most likely target that you're going to use for credit cards. The second op uh, exception here, the second special case is going to be a debt. So I'm going to set up a personal loan the account type is going to be one of these loans here. So basically, you won't even see this option in YNAB unless you've set up one of these accounts here that is a debt. So if I choose a personal loan option and I put in a balance with an interest rate and a monthly payment, I'm then going to pair this with this personal loan and hit done. You will now notice that when I go to this personal loan and I come over here, you'll notice that the options for the target are non-existent. Basically, I don't have all the other options I had earlier. I only can choose this debt payment target. And that's because this category is linked to this account. Again, that's probably outside the scope of this video to go deep into the debt uh, accounts and wine app. I'm going to have other videos on that, but I did want to tell you those are the two exceptions to the uh, the targeting that I've talked about earlier. Now that covers all the target types, but I have a couple more things to show you and they go hand in hand. The first has to do with the total target. So you'll remember at the top of the video, I discussed how one of the benefits to targets is being able to compare your total targets with your income. Well, if you've got all of your targets set, as I have here, and you go into a month where you haven't funded anything yet, so you'll notice that my assigned column is completely zeroed out. All of the assignments are at zero. I haven't put any money in here yet. And you'll notice that I've set targets for basically all of my categories. In the top right-hand corner, the underfunded number that we looked at earlier when we're auto assigning, that is the total of all of my targets. Now, technically underfunded means this is the amount of money that you need to finish funding the current month that you're in. But because I'm in a month where I haven't funded anything yet, the underfunded represents all of my targets. That's why often if people have already assigned stuff like this here, I will have them click and go one month into the future and look at the underfunded number there. Now, let's come back here and let's take a look at this underfunded. So what this is telling us is it's saying that I need $8,188.21 every month in order to fully fund all of these targets. 
And if you were really quick on the draw there, you noticed that when I had started to fund things and then went forward one month into the future, you noticed that number's different. Why is that? Well, what happens is that some of your targets that have due dates, like visiting family for Thanksgiving or this big winter cabin trip or the Christmas spending, those things that have future dates, if I don't fully hit those targets this month, then next month they change in order for me to stay on track. For example, let's take a look at this big winter cabin trip. You'll see here that the target is $3,000 by November 2025. It wants $200 this month to stay on track. It's doing the math between now and November 2025. When I go forward into October, you'll notice it has now increased the target to 214 because I didn't fully fund it in September. Either way, what I want you to hone in on is that your total targets right here should ideally be less than your income. Actually, even more ideally, I want them to be spot on with your income. Now, you might be thinking, are you telling me to spend more money? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm telling you. But what I am saying is that in this case, if I had a household income of $7,500 a month, then I would need to go through and really look at my targets and see where I could cut some things to get my underfunded down to $7,500 a month. Whereas if I had a household income of, let's say, 9000 a month, well, then I might go and think about what are my big goals? What is my number one financial you know, focus right now? Is it debt? Is it getting a month ahead? Is it investing? And I might see where can I actually increase my targets? Could I come down here to my IRA contribution and bump that up to you know, $1,000 a month? And if I did that, well, then all of a sudden, here I am at my $9,000 target. So the bottom line is that targets, when used correctly, allow you to compare your income to your game plan and make sure that your game plan will actually work based on the money that you make. And also, if you're trying to increase your income, it helps you kind of build out a plan and understand how much you need to make in order to live the life that you want to have. Related to this, there is one little cool feature that WineAb introduced, uh, I think later last year actually, called Snooze. And this is kind of nice because over time, uh, there are going to be times where as the month goes, you're not going to want to fully fund a target. Maybe you started out and you had originally funded your fast food, but then as the month went by, you ended up deciding to move money from fast food somewhere else into your budget. And then when you did that, YNAB is now prompting you, hey, dude, you need to fund your target again. But maybe you're like, I don't want to fund my target this month. I just want to use that money for something else. That's where the snooze button comes in. So if you are like me and you don't like these yellow kind of, you know, things yelling at you when you don't fund your target, you can hit the snooze button and that just hits the snooze button on the alarm clock. It toggles the target off for this month. And then in October, the target will come right back ready to go. So that's my deep dive on YNAB targets. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like the video and leave a comment down below. I would greatly appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one.